We are really honored uh, to partner with Tri-C Center for Creative Arts and the Conflict Resolution and Peace Studies Program to help present Hiding in the Spotlight. Uh, tonight is a fitting beginning to Case Western Reserve University's Baker Nord Center for the Humanities Humanities Week, uh, which is really bringing us all together to do some great work, which shows the power of the arts and humanities to provide us to think carefully and critically about um, our understanding of our contemporary time and tonight's subject, our history. Good evening and welcome to Power of Music, a book history and music discussion presented by Cuyahoga Community College and Mandel Humanities Center. Uh, in the book Hiding in the Spotlight, Musical Prodigy Story of Survival 1941 to 1946, our special guest Greg Dawson writes about his mother, Jana Arshinskaya Dawson, an extraordinary woman who survived World War II by playing music for those who killed her entire family in 1941. Her musical genius saves her from being exterminated by a German Nazi machine, the same machine that murdered millions of innocent civilians in occupied Europe. Thank you for coming and enjoy our program. At age 14, she escaped from a death march when her father bribed a guard with a gold watch to turn his head. When the guard wasn't looking, my mother vanished into the countryside wearing the winter coat off her father's back and his final words still ringing in her ears. I don't care what you do, he said, just stay alive. Her younger sister, Frina, escaped later and they were reunited. Both girls were piano prodigies and together, they survived the Holocaust by changing their identities and serving as captive entertainers for the Nazis who did not realize they were Jewish. After the war, they came to America, studied at the Juilliard, and my mother married a virtuoso named David Dawson. In September, I visited Ukraine to retrace my mother's remarkable odyssey. I went to the seaside village of Berdyansk, where she was born and played her first public performance at age six. In the city of Haikov, I saw the dilapidated apartment building where she spent much of her childhood and where the Nazis came banging on the door that terrible night in 1941. I walked the halls of the grammar school she attended and visited the music conservatory where she studied. I broke bread in the same home where she was sheltered by a courageous Gentile family after the girls had escaped the death march to a place called Drabitsky Yar. Yar is Russian for ravine or ditch. It was assumed that no one escaped the death march to Drabitsky Yar, where 16,000 Jews were lined up, shot in the back, and pushed into the ditch. At the Drabitsky Yar Memorial, there's a candlelit room of tragedy with the names of 4,300 of the victims etched on the walls. I ran my finger down the list and found the names of my grandparents and my great-grandparents. But I was not prepared for what I saw next. It was my mother's name, etched there among the dead. Frina's too. Our special guest from Florida is an accomplished journalist, TV critic, and writer whose book, Hiding in the Spotlight, is our main topic tonight. Mr. Greg Dawson, welcome to Cleveland. Tonight he's joined by several academics, and they are Dr. David Redles, and he's Associate Professor of History from Cuyahoga Community College, Professor Mary Kowanek, Associate Professor of History, again from Cuyahoga Community College, Dr. Sean Martin, a historian from the Western Reserve Historical Society, Professor Kira Sitton, Assistant Professor of Music at uh, Cuyahoga Community College, and uh, I'm Bruno Tatalovich, assistant professor of journalism here at Tri-C. I found this book about a year and a half ago on Amazon and I read it in a couple of days and I first I couldn't believe what I was reading and then uh, I decided to contact you, Greg, and we established the communication and uh, you told me that you were growing up for decades not knowing this story could you tell us how did you find out your mother's story that started all of this? How is it possible that I grew up not knowing this story? Well, uh, I grew up uh, in Bloomington, Indiana in the 50s and 60s. It was a secular home. My father was a, a Catholic from Virginia. My mother's family, they were not religious Jews or cultural Jews, proud Jews, but, uh, but they were not religious. So I grew up in a secular home. Uh, my mother did not uh, choose to share with me and my younger brother, Bill, 
her personal story uh, about the Holocaust. And many years later, when I spoke to her uh, in preparation for doing this book, I asked her that. I said, how could you not tell me about the most important event in your life? And she had a very wonderful, simple answer. She said, I felt that I wanted you to have normal childhoods. And I felt that it would be too cruel to tell you this story at that age. And so that's the simple reason she did not tell us the story. And for our family, for us, it turned out to be uh, the right decision because we did have normal childhoods. And, and we grew up without, uh, we don't, not knowing the story, so we missed out on that. But I feel that, I feel that it, uh, she accomplished her goal. And for our family, it was the correct decision. There are many other Jewish homes uh, with, with survivors where the story was shared with children at a younger age, and for that, those families, it, it, was, it, was the correct, it, was, it was the correct thing to do. Many of them lived in bigger cities. Uh, Bloomington, Indiana is a small place, but if you lived in, if you grew up as a second generation survivor in New York or Philadelphia or Chicago or someplace with, there where there were a lot of immigrants, um, and if, you, if your family was, uh, was, relig was Jewish, was religious, and went to synagogue, it would have been hard to avoid the knowledge of the Holocaust. So I was perfectly situated to be sheltered from this story. Right? And, and so, of course, I was aware that my mother was Russian. I knew that. And, and she, was, uh, she was the only one in the neighborhood. And, and she, I was bilingual until I was started going to school, at which point I became very self-conscious about, about being the only kid on the playground who spoke the uh, language of our mortal enemy, the Russians. <laughs> and so, and, and back then it was actually no joke uh, during the Cold War and McCarthyism. So I asked my mother, please don't speak Russian to me in front of my friends. And so she, she stopped, and I now wish we both knew that was a bad mistake because <laughs> Um, I lost all my Russian, but, and an easy way to satisfy my language requirement in college, but. <laughs> so, uh, in any case, I grew up knowing in a general sense that, uh, that she came over uh, after the war, and that, uh, but that was about it, had been caught up in the war in some way. And that uh, when I was a teenager, I sort of became dimly aware of the fact that I was Jewish, and I was proud of that as well. Um, actually, I had a very Jewish upbringing because uh, even though, uh, you know, my parents' colleagues at the School of Music in Indiana were almost all of them were Jewish. And uh, so we had many Jewish friends in our home. We had the Jewish uh, food, the humor, the music, everything but the religion. Um, but uh, I did not know anything about the story here that you saw uh, that's in the book until I was almost 30 years old. By that time, I'd become a, a journalist. I was a reporter. And uh, this is 1978, when the Holocaust miniseries aired on NBC. If those of you who remember it, it was a huge event, not just a television event, but a social, uh, a sort of cultural event for this country. It was the first time that American TV had dealt with the Holocaust in, a, in an extended, serious way. And, and so I was working at the time as a, a columnist at the paper in Bloomington, and I decided there had to be a column for me somewhere in this big event. So I called my mother, who by that time was living in Milwaukee, teaching in Milwaukee, and, um, and I said, gee, Mom, there's this uh, uh, miniseries coming on, it's about the Holocaust, and I wonder if you could share with me uh, any, any memories or experiences that you had during the war that might be connected with this in some way. And, and boy, did she. <laughs> and so for the next hour and a half, I was on the phone, I, didn't have headsets back in those days. I had one of those cradles. I was like this, typing frantically for an hour and a half, hearing this most incredible story. And it was it was so amazing that I, I, I was telling David earlier. It was hard to connect my mother, this person I'd known 30 years, with the incredible story she was telling me. And and so um, mainly my my thought that kept running through my head as she was telling me the story is, oh my gosh, what a great story this is going to make. <laughs> and I feel bad about that because I was thinking as a journalist instead of a son and a good Jew. So, 
but uh, that's how I first found about it. Out about it, it was 1978. Uh, thanks to thanks to really to television. And, uh, and it took probably another 15, 20 years till you decided yeah. to, to write a book. Right, and then, and then we'll go into that now. But yes, it yes. was another 15 years before. Yeah. So let's go. Uh, uh, let's go a little bit to the beginning of this story. Uh, Jana was born. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. She was born in 1927 in Berdyansk. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah, so the story starts uh, in Berdyansk in 1927. And this is the question for everybody on this panel, uh, uh, so we can introduce the audience a little bit about uh, history and geography of this region. This is the uh, Soviet Union, Ukraine. How was the life uh, in Ukraine in late 20s, early 30s, when she was born and she was growing up? In, in life in general, uh, obviously, it would have been um, 1917 is when the 1917 Russian Revolution had taken place. And so they were living under a new regime. Um, working class is coming forward in terms of rights and, and trying to figure out who they are and what the population is like. Um, people would have been still pr pretty much, I think, poor. Uh, life would not have been that great in the 1920s. Communists first took power. They tried what they called war communism, which was a disaster during the Civil War. Uh, led to starvation, led to uh, peasants uh, hiding grain, killing livestock. Uh, Lenin introduced the, what was called the New Economic Policy, the NEP, which actually allowed a little bit of capitalism, and that allowed people uh, to make a little bit of money, uh, to have shops, uh, I guess your, your grandfather made candy, and, and, and that was working quite well. But then Stalin uh, decided to collectivize the, the peasants of, of Ukraine uh, to uh, an attempt to create massive farms that would increase agricultural production, and it was an absolute disaster. And it led to the, the starvation of upwards of 10 million people. Uh, he closed the borders, would not allow anyone out. Anyone who reported on the disaster, they themselves found themselves dead. Uh, and that was, uh, in the early 30s, an absolute disaster. As we start to get to the later 30s, things start to look a little bit better, and there looks to be some hope. Um, um, and then war breaks out, and it falls. Uh, Ukraine falls between Germany and Russia, and becomes a pawn between the two. Yeah, Dr. Martin, you want to well, I, I was also struck by our author's comments about his family's uh, identity as a secular Jewish family, and it's important to remember at, at this time, of course, that in the Soviet Union, they're not allowed to express any religious ideas freely. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about your family's Jewish identity and, and what traces, if any, might have been, been passed on through Jana and how she defined them. There was no emphasis put on the fact that uh, at all that my that my mother was Jewish, and that, as I said, it was kind of ironic because, in many ways, it was a very Jewish upbringing because of the of all the other things that I mentioned, and my, my my parents' involvement with the school of music and and the the very Jewish milieu that that was. And my father went to Juilliard when he was uh, 14 years old from Virginia, and uh, and he. When he went there, he was surrounded at the Juilliard by Jewish students, and who would take him home on the weekend. And his mothers, their mothers would give him uh, chicken soup and latkes, and and uh, he just loved New York. He fell in love with that culture. And my mother always said about my father that, she, that he was the best Jew that she ever knew. Uh, and uh, and and so, but but that's really the way it was for me growing up. And um, again, you have to remember that I knew nothing about of what happened to her at all, and so and that obviated any real discussion of... of and we'll get to that point uh, yeah. eventually. I would like to touch uh, now a little bit on, on her musical upbringing, and uh, from what I read, she started playing piano already at age four or five, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, a question for uh, Professor Kira Seaton, is this uh, something uncommon? We have a pr prodigy that's a four or five year old, and she's already recording uh, at local radio station playing piano? It is pretty amazing. Uh, I think it's one of the, the hallmarks of all of this is that this is an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary family that um, from the book you can read that uh, although Papa, not much of a musician, was definitely encouraging these, these kids. And, and Jana especially has this kind of unique, very independent spirit. Um, I'm not sure unless you read the book that you really get that the first picture you saw with her sitting in her underwear at the piano is absolutely her. That's her. And in fact, going out and wandering around the streets of their city in just her underwear. So she's sitting there at the piano, not wanting to practice. The reason they, the reason she is sitting there, 
taking lessons is that she was wandering the streets and they had to, they thought we have to get this kid off the street. We'll stick her in piano lessons, that's what we'll do. She comes from a musical family, Dmitry Arshansky, he was a really good violin violinist. And, uh, can you tell us more about uh, Dmitry? My grandfather was a, a very good amateur violinist and he, uh, he worshipped Paganini and he would, uh, had a book showing, uh, showing about Paganini and he had it open to the page showing Paganini's bow uh, positions and he would try to mimic him to see if he could figure if he could just mimic that he could play like Paganini well <laughs> and didn't exactly work out that way but he really worshipped it music was at the center of his life right now we see actually the photograph of Jana and Frina I don't know what age it might be circa early 1930s I believe Frina was also a, a really good uh, piano player too yeah she was and she she was also very jealous of her older sister who uh, who got all the attention, the early attention, and who's the star and all that, and that was an intense rivalry that they had uh, all their lives. And uh, but she she wanted to, to to start playing immediately. She was too young, and but she she became she started her lessons uh, not long after my mother, and she quickly developed in her own right as a as a as a fine as a fine artist. This is a culture in in that time in Europe that was very well versed in music. I mean, certainly the German population knew music and and Russia, and and it, um, you could be a superstar. I mean, you could definitely be. This, this wonderful musician and, and be well well thought of. I'm not necessarily sure that anybody ever you know, became terribly famous and, 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 and rich off of this, but the appreciation was, was definitely there for this and, and nurtured. It was, it still is. A matter of fact, one thing I discovered is that the, the Russians, as, as David was said, Russians were terrible at agriculture, but they were great at culture. And they, and they had a series of what we would call today magnet schools set up around the country to find and develop the finest young musicians. And that my mother and Frida benefited from that. And it, it, was, it was a part of their, part of their Soviet uh, beliefs is to, to, to do this. It was one of, the few, one of the few positive aspects of that system. Um, and, and yes, it was innate, there was a lot of innate ability, but it was also a belief a uh, general collective belief that it was important to nurture, uh, to nurture beauty in classical music and other arts as well. Um, one of the heartbreaking aspects, I think, of your, of your mother's story is her connection to Russian culture and, and the, the connection to, to what she sees as her Russian homeland in some way, at least until a certain point in her story. And so I was just wondering if you could say more about that and her father's connection to this really classical European culture as well. Well, I tell you, if you ask my mother uh, how she self-identifies, she would say, number one, Russian, number two, Jewish, number three, Ukrainian. And, and, and that's the way she perceives it. Again, uh, uh, Haikov, Harkov, where they lived, and Bryansk is in far eastern Ukraine, which, of course, historically, linguistically, culturally, is very aligned uh, at, to, to Russia, to old Russia. I don't want to stereotype here, but since I lived with one all my life, I can do that. Um, <laughs> Russians are special, and they have a special ferocity. They're adamant about everything, and everything is my mother is whether it's her music or what she's fixing. This is the best. It's absolutely the best. And of course, if you ask her, Russian music is the best, you know, and Russian poetry was the best. I'm coming from Eastern Europe, and I hope everybody understands my English here. Uh, but uh, coming from a socialist country myself, I know how uh, certain things were not allowed, certain things were suppressed, but again, uh, cultural things like music, uh, like sports, like cinema, it was uh, emphasized and, and, and we had uh, a lot of people, a lot of famous people from, and from 1920s, 1930s, uh, even later uh, throughout uh, socialist uh, years in Eastern Europe. Uh, but it is a complex, uh, very complex part of the world, and we see it even now, what's happening there in Ukraine. The, the division you talk about really between the Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine is really significant, um, even in terms of language nuances, in terms of the two, the two parts of Ukraine. Um, and certainly the Eastern Ukraine had much more of a, a Russian influence, but Western Ukrainians would believe that, the, that Kharkiv was indeed is, is Ukrainian, obviously. Um, but the, the, the problems continue to this day. But it was a very repressive time for the Ukrainians. Um, they were, were, again, being very, very suppressed. It was very anti-religious, no doubt, at that time, against Catholicism, against Orthodoxy. Um, the, um, we had the, the, the extermination of the Catholic Church, the extermination of the Ukrainian Church at that point. Um, 
mess, again, uh, scholars being in prison, that continued through the 60s and 70s and turned, and now we've had the Maidan, the Orange Revolution, and the Maidan movement, etc. Um, so it's a very complicated past, and they had just gained their independence for a very short period of time, and then were once again swept under the Soviet regime, regained independence in the 1990s, and, and once again, they're, they're still trying to figure out who they are and what they should Exactly, have. very, very complex uh, society, like any other country in Eastern Europe, still uh, developing, and, and you know, since 1990s, uh, not any of those countries can say they are stable because a lot of things are happening there. Back to music, a uh, um, little bit about uh, Frédéric Chopin, great Polish-French composer. Kira, would you like to say something about him? By his, uh, this girl, Jana Arshaskaya, she carried this sheet of music, uh, Frédéric Chopin's uh, fantasy impromptu. She, uh, she went back to her apartment in 1941, grabbed this sheet of music, and carried for next uh, four years, not only for four years, she carried for the rest of her life. What's so significant about Chopin and fantasy impromptu? Well, I kind of feel like the music is the through line to all of this story anyway. Um, but, okay, so Chopin is an expatriate. He is living in France. Um, he is watching uh, the Russian invasion of, of Poland in his lifetime. In fact, there's a, a, an incredible piece called The Revolutionary Etude, um, which if you ever get a chance to listen to it while you're angry, it's like the perfect angst music, right? Um, but um, Chopin was, was, a, was a Polish person, and, and uh, he felt being driven out of his home to some extent. Uh, but the other thing about Chopin to remember is, is we're talking about the, the mid-1800s, a different period. Um, he is publishing music, he is putting things out there, he is pretty much living off of uh, his, his, own, uh, his own skill. But this is the era of, of uh, romantic music, and in romantic music, you know, it's, you, 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 uh, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of kind of living in garrets and all of those things that we associate with the, the romantic uh, ideal. But this piece, specifically the, the, uh, the fantasy impromptu, uh, unpublished until after his death, and there's several different versions of it, I am sure that our, our pianist could probably tell you even more about that. But uh, it is, it is a, a very special, very unique piece, and for her to have uh, chosen it, not an easy piece, by the way, under any circumstances, um, for her to have, have grabbed it and chosen it, obviously it's beloved to her. Um, it becomes kind of a hallmark of how she is, is successful. And it's still just, we were talking about this earlier, it just amazes me that this is this, what, like five pieces of paper that she's able to hang on to this whole time. And I think it does definitely, it's, if, if I were writing a movie, it would be the representative little thing all the way through here, that you have this piece of this person who's not written by this person who's not allowed to be in their homeland, just like her. Uh, Greg, did she ever tell you why fantasy impromptu? Because that obviously was the first love of her when it comes to music, did she ever disclose why she was in love with this particular piece of music versus Beethoven? She was introduced to it by her first professor at the music conservatory in Heiko. Uh, professor Lutz was his name. And uh, he, he gave it to her to learn. She was eight years old, I guess. I think 1937, later, is the family moves from, uh, uh, from Berdyansk to Kharkov. And uh, and Jan and Trina are enrolled uh, in a conservatory over there in a prestigious school, and there we find another connection to to one very famous pianist uh, from the Horowitz family. Can can you tell us more about how that came about? Well, uh, also one of the professors, one of the instructors, professors at the at the same conservatory conservatory was Regina Horowitz, who was uh, Vladimir's older sister, and Vladimir had. Had uh, had left had left Ukraine to pursue a solo career in Europe, and ultimately uh, ultimately came to this country, of course. And but but she chose to stay there, and and she became a very famous um, pedagogue. Regina Horowitz taught them ensemble playing during the war. They played two pianos, four hands, quite a bit. And and it was uh, that. Just a quick question to, uh, to Kira: uh, yeah. What's four hands for somebody who doesn't know? Okay, so it's piano duets, uh, and and oftentimes it's four hands on one piano. So somebody is is got the bass part, 
and they're playing, you know, chords and other other melodies, and then so they're sitting on a bench together, or maybe they're sitting on two chairs, and the other person has the upper part, and uh, usually the upper part is the melody. So sometimes there's probably a little bit of competition about who gets to play the top part, uh, and in fact that goes on into this the overture, the, the Beethoven, that they learned this orchestra piece, have this version of this orchestra piece. Uh, that's for piano four hands, which is pretty pretty amazing. If you think of all of the different instruments that you can play being boiled down into piano four hands, that's that's an accomplishment. And at that time, they were only what uh, 10 or 11 years old. That was late 30s. Years. They were sent out to perform around the city during the onset of the war. They were even sent to places where soldiers were. There were soldiers, and they would go from go around the city, and they, they would they would perform. They were written about in the in the local newspapers and so on. So they were. So, so they became really famous, as like most famous teenagers in the Eastern Ukraine, or something like that. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, they were very well known. Uh, so well known that it came back later to to, to, to to be a problem for them when they were trying to conceal their identity, because you know there were a lot of people who knew exactly who they were, and there were some of their own fellow uh, uh, Ukrainians or uh, red, the friends in, in in their town who. They saw later in the year, later in the war, who tried to expose them, who tried to betray them to the Nazis, uh, who were they were not Jews, and went to the Nazis and said those girls are Jews, and that's another part of the story. But they were very well known. Yes, that one. I think this is the right time to uh, introduce our, our special performer, piano performer. Can I do that? So we can obviously, so we can hear <laughs> the part of this fantasy in front of Kira. Go ahead. Okay, so, so a little bit of history. I'm a storyteller. It's kind of what I do for the college. Um, so the performer we're going to hear, Emanuela Frischoni, has a long-time relationship with the college. Uh, her husband is Antonio Pompabaldi, who you might know that name as the winner uh, uh, at one time of the Cleveland International Piano Competition. And when he and his equally talented pianist wife came to the U.S., uh, for the competition and all of that, our then president heard them and just fell in love with them. And so they were artists in residence here for a while, had some lessons and all of this.